Folks, protests are literally happening all across America as we speak as a result of today's Supreme Court decision, a five to four vote outlawing Roe v. v. Wade in America, meaning a woman does not have a constitutional right to abortion. The Supreme Court, of course, ruled this in 1973. Uh, it has been the law of the land. Numerous Supreme Court justices appear before uh, the U.S. Senate at uh, the confirmations hearing and talked about star decisis, saying that, uh, look, the law is uh, the law. It is precedent, but it is abundantly clear that it's not the case. Now, it was a five to four decision. Chief Justice John, Ro- John Roberts, of course, did not side with those of the majority. He did say he would have ruled in favor of of the Mississippi abortion case, that was the bill, that was the case that came before the court uh, that established uh, this uh, ruling. But he said he would not overturn Roe v. Wade. The other five Supreme Court justices, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, they disagreed with him. It is a five to four vote. Uh, of course, many of us knew this was, this was coming down when the draft opinion of Justice Samuel Alito was leaked uh, several weeks ago. Also, conservatives were very clear. This is what they had been planning to do and working towards for the last 40 plus years. So it should be no shock to anybody what happened, but it is still a shock that Roe v. Wade is no more in the United States of America. Uh, Let's go to our panel. Let's break this thing down. we got lots of folks on today's show. Uh, Representative Nakima Williams joins us. She, of course, Congresswoman uh, from Georgia. We have Pilar Whitaker, Council Economic Justice Project and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Uh, the Lawyers Committee brief uh, was cited twice in the dissent, uh, and Pilar worked on that particular brief. Also, Melody Campbell, she's president and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, also convener of the Black Women's Roundtable. Ionfe Metzger is director of state media campaigns for Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Uh, Kelly Bethea, communication strategist, joins us. We'll be later joined by Tanya Washington Hicks, professor at Georgia State University College of Law, and also Renita Shannon, who's a state representative uh, in Georgia. Plus, we have uh, our panel, Shereen Mitchell, social media analyst, diversity strategist, Dr. Larry J. Walker, assistant professor, University of Central Florida, Michael M. Hotep, host of the African History Network show, Reese Cobra, founder of Black Women Views. And so we're going to be covering this from all different angles. First and foremost, uh, let me start with you. Congresswoman Williams, uh, you have a lot of progressives. We're sitting here thinking that, hey, uh, here's the deal. You, you know, you, Democrats had uh, the votes. They had the power. They could have actually codified Roe v. Wade, making it law, but they didn't. They left it up to the Supreme Court thinking, hey, precedent is precedent. The conservatives on the Supreme Court made clear today they could change whatever they want because they hold the power. The nine most powerful people in America Five of them showed it today. So, Roland, first of all, thank you for covering this issue. As you can see, I'm not in the best place for this interview or this conversation, but it is all good. And so important that I was going to call in from wherever I was. I just left a group of people that have rallied at Union Station in D.C. Um, I was at the Supreme Court earlier today with other members of Congress because this is a critical issue right now. And I think people are just realizing how critical it is and all of the things that we said could happen are happening right now. And so what what we do know is that the House of Representatives has passed the Women's Health Protection Act and it sits in the Senate. So there is a vehicle, there is policy that could codify Roe v. Wade this week if we had the political will of the United States Senate to get it done. We know that we don't have the 60 votes in the Senate to get this passed. And so what that tells me is that we're going back to the ballot box in November and we're going to make sure that we get people that not only support our right to bodily autonomy and make personal private medical decisions, but this is also linked to voting rights. If we can't have free and fair access to the ballot, it impedes my right to reproductive freedom and reproductive justice. So this is all linked. And so I don't want anybody to think that this doesn't apply to them because today they're coming for abortion rights. They already came for voting rights, but tomorrow they're coming for your rights too. So we're all in this together, Roland. Uh, It is interesting. I saw uh, tweets and posts from Senator Susan Collins, uh, Senator Joe Manchin saying that they they were misled. I'm sorry. We all knew that these conservative justices were not going uh, to support Roe v. Wade. And so I'm like, come on, y'all. Really? Seriously? They knew. And someone asked me a few weeks ago, like, what do I say about when these 
people applying to be justices to the Supreme Court sit in Senate Judiciary and they say things that, you know, don't follow up with what I'm like, let's just call it what it is. They lied. They sat there in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee and they lied about where they were on Roe v. Wade. But advocates tried to tell them. People on the ground told the senators where people stood on Roe v. Wade and they didn't want to listen to us. They wanted to live in this fantasy land that everybody is telling them the truth that comes before them on that judiciary committee and now we see what we've gotten but you know what we have the opportunity the last say does not lie with the supreme court it doesn't lie with the united states senate it lies with the people on the ground the voters on the ground and so this morning i woke up i was upset i was pissed but roland now i'm motivated i'm motivated to keep organizing to keep marching and i'm motivated to make sure that we get people elected to office that are going to stand up for my rights uh, i know you got to catch a flight i got to ask you this question here i saw all these people outside of the supreme court they were joined by members of congress uh and, and this is what i say and let me be real clear there were a lot of white people who were out there there were a lot of white women and and, and i'm i gotta go ahead and say it i say it this when black people were out in front of that supreme court uh for the for the people act for the john lewis act a lot of those white folks were not out there and i kept saying hey where y'all at george floyd justice act black folks were protesting getting arrested in the senate and i kept saying hey white women hey white progressives where y'all at and this is a perfect example black people we don't leave the battlefield we haven't left the battlefield we can't afford to leave the battlefield and i think now these white Democrats and white progressives are now realizing y'all can't go home and think everything is all well. Black folks have been trying to tell y'all. That's why we use the hashtag, we tried to tell you. Roland, you are exactly right. We are all in this together, and we've been saying that all along. We stand on the front lines for everybody in the movement, and we get the intentionality of our movement. It's time for everyone else to realize that all of our fights are interconnected. All right, Congresswoman Akima Williams, I know you got to catch a flight. We surely appreciate you taking some time to join us right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Thank you, Roland. Uh, I'm going to bring in uh, the uh, other members of my panel here. Um, uh, Pilar, I want to start with you. You um, were, first of all, you're, you participated in, in one of these briefs writing it. And uh, walk us through what this court decided today. Uh, what are the real life implications? I already said uh, that uh, you have attorney generals uh, who I think, I think the language is they certify, if you will, the Supreme Court's ruling. Uh, and already uh, it's happened in Arkansas. We, I saw, I'm going to show a tweet a little bit later uh, where you've got uh, abortion clinics uh, in West Virginia and other places. They've been canceling appointments. And so in several states right now, this ruling is in effect as we speak. I want to highlight that this ruling actually goes far beyond just the outlaw of abortion in these states. Justice Alito's opinion encouraged states to not just outlaw abortion, but to criminalize it. And we know that Black women and communities of color are already over-policed and over-surveilled in these conservative states and elsewhere throughout the United States. Um, and the fact that this opinion has directed the states, essentially directed the states, to criminalize abortion, um, that means that we're going to see Black women and other women of color um, have their pregnancies under scrutiny um, when women experience miscarriages, uh, which is unfortunate, but a, a common occurrence during pregnancy, um, there might be increased suspicion for criminal penalties. And so I think that's the biggest um, concern for us as, as a racial justice organization, the Lawyers Committee, is the criminalization of abortion. And when we say criminal penalties, now as a result of this, there's a significant amount of power that now rests in the hands of district attorneys. And so walk us through what you know what that potentially looks like. So right now, let's talk Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, West Virginia. What could DAs do right now if a woman chooses uh, to try to get uh, an abortion or if someone um, uh, is trying to provide one, what actually could happen? Well, we know that Texas has permitted um, basically bounty hunting on people who assist or provide abortions. And so we know that there are definitely civil penalties at play here. Um, and we also know that also occurring in Texas, a woman was arrested just a few short weeks ago for under suspicion of having attained an abortion. So this is a very real threat. 
Um, and what really matters here is that we go to the polls and we uh, make our voices known that we will not stand for our bodies to be uh, criminalized and heavily surveilled in the way that this court is asking the states to do today. Um, it is, uh, again, uh, quite uh, a change, uh, Ionfe, at what is happening. Again, uh, I have been seeing uh, different reports uh, already. Uh, I saw one tweet where women were calling, uh, sh crying, sobbing uncontrollably uh, in West Virginia uh, because we're the only uh, clinic there uh, no longer can provide the services uh, to uh, those women. Uh, you even have some conservatives who are literally trying to pass laws in their states that would even make it illegal for women to go out of state. And so uh, g g give our listeners and viewers an understanding uh, of how far this goes. And, and not only that, this bill in Mississippi, the Supreme Court ruled on, sorry, this law, uh, had no had no exception for rape, rape or incest. And so what used to be in, among many Republicans, it is now it, it is now uh, where you don't even have even that limitation in some of these laws that they're actually passing. Yes. That's true. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes. You're absolutely yeah, yeah. right. Um, this has been a really devastating day um, for women and anybody who supports our protective freedom across the country. I mean, you you uh, mentioned West Virginia, um, but you know, in some states like Wisconsin and South Dakota, they had stopped providing abortion. Um, before the decision because they didn't want people to be in a position where they were at a health center and, and then a decision came down and they were desperate and had to figure out what to do in that moment. So it's been really bad for several weeks. I mean, this, this was coming, um, but we know that across the country, 36 million people are going to be affected by this decision. Um, people in the majority of um, the Midwest and Southern states who already have the hardest time getting care. There's going to be Black people, Indigenous people, Latino people, people who have long, long, long always been dis discriminated against in the healthcare system. And now they're going to be desperate. They're going to have to be um, either carry a pregnancy to determine that they cannot um, support or seek health care outside the um, traditional medical system. And so it's a really, really devastating time. And I don't think that people fully understand what this means because states that will um, still have abortion access cannot absorb the other states that will not. And it's going to be a really, really, it, 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 this is a healthcare crisis, um, which, is, which is what we need to call it. And it's really devastating already. And it's been swift to see states already move to ban abortion within the first hours of this decision coming down. Uh, um, Melanie, uh, you know, it, it's been it's been really interesting as, as I have um, uh, looked at uh, different um, uh, folks commenting on this uh, and what we we're seeing. There were there were a number of people. I saw uh, Neil uh, Cattell, who was Solicitor General under Obama, who wrote a column in The New York Times saying uh, liberals should support Neil Gorsuch. Uh, and I tweeted and he was retweeting all of these things today, lamenting this decision. And I sent him a tweet. I'm like. Do you now, you know, frankly, apologize for what you wrote? He even introduced Neil Gorsuch at his confirmation hearings. I remember Kathleen Parker writes in the Washington Post, uh, hey, folks, calm down. There's not going to be any change, no difference if Trump wins over Hillary Clinton. Trump appointed three of these conservative Supreme Court justices. And so I think people are now realizing uh, those of us, folk like you, folk like me, we tried to tell America, we tried to say, hey, we know what states' rights supporters look like. And now people are now realizing we were right and they should listen to black people. Uh, yeah, Roland, you know, uh, we were out there in the streets, you know, trying to connect the dots for folks, trying to get, uh, you know, multiracial coalitions together. Because at the end of the day, really, this started with what happened in 2016. Um, you know, a lot of folks I know, you know, say they're grieving, you know, uh, I won't say I'm grieving, I'm mad as hell because we didn't have to be here today, right? But the reality is in 2016, when folks voted for Trump over Hillary Clinton, this is set, this was set in motion. This was set in motion. And so here we are, um, in this situation that we find ourselves in and those same people are going to, and Clarence Thomas is, you know, uh, uh, what he wrote in his uh, um, in, in the in the decision uh, is saying, let's go for uh, getting rid of contraception, uh, uh, sodomy laws. Let's let's this they're coming for it, right? And so we're in a moment where 
there's this opportunity with, with the way people vote, right? Uh, and I'm not blaming all white women, but white women voted for Trump twice. 53% so, in 2016. Yeah, in 55 and, and 20, uh, 20. And so here we are, elections have consequences. Yeah. So what I'm hopeful is that young people will stand up and push back because those old men sitting on that Supreme Court and that one white woman that decided that she, you know, she, we knew what she was going to do before she got on the bench. And so here we are with them legislating from the bench. And there's an opportunity. Um, and I'm nonpartisan, so I can't get into to, But just as Melanie Campbell, at the end of the day, we have this opportunity to decide who's going to control the House and the Senate and whether or not you can vote enough people onto the Senate to uh, put Manchin and Cinema to the side. That's the bottom line. Or nothing is going to get done. And we're going to keep seeing these rollbacks. And they're going to come after affirmative action. They're going to come after anything that is about progressive movement and inclusion that addresses the reality that we live in a multiracial, multi-ethnic society. And that the browning of America is not going to change. And the fact of the matter is white women are not going to go sit back and get chastity belts and go sit in, in their bedrooms and let their husbands or their tell them what to do. But they're going to have, they have more resources to get on a plane and fly to another state. They have more resources to go to Canada or Mexico. And, right. But our people don't. And the, um, the, um, the fact that this is also uh, going to threaten lives of babies, you're going to make a 12 a, a year old have a baby. Uh, if, they, if they're a raped, you know, uh, with incest, this is where we are. But when you, they have a focus on where they're going, and it is about keeping white men in a certain level of power. Mm -hmm. And if you can control my body, you control me. And Pilar, this goes beyond even just me. Obviously, this is a fundamental issue, but it goes beyond this. That uh, that writing of of Justice Clarence Thomas. He is saying, he is saying, hey, all y'all gay folks who marry, we now can take that away from you. Contraception, we can now take that away. We are now talking about with the conservatives having a 6-3 majority. They literally, we saw it with the gun decision. They are on an absolute state's rights focus that could up in any number of legal precedents. That's true. And I think that the, the, the major point of this opinion was uh, Justice Alito encouraging people to get out to vote, um, saying that this is now a state's right issue and really placing the power in the hands of the elected officials. But what's actually um, odd about all that is that we know that this Supreme Court has spent the last several years gutting the Voting Rights Act, limiting the right to vote, especially for communities of color, allowing rampant voting uh, suppression to, to occur in the states. Um, and so it's actually gaslighting the American people to suggest well, the remedy for this is to vote. Um, and so right. know, these senators and these state these state legislators, they are coming for our rights and we need to be prepared and we do need to figure out how are we gonna get to these polls? How are we gonna overcome these numerous barriers um, in order to have a, a modicum of a chance of stopping this from happening? And Pilar, I remember this same, well, obviously you know this, but for the audience, the same Supreme Court said, Justice John Roberts, hey, uh, you know what? We can't do anything about gerrymandering. So part of the issue now is that where black people are living, we're living in southern states. Republicans are controlling Florida. Uh, they're controlling Tennessee. They're controlling, uh, I mean, Mississippi, Alabama. They're controlling Louisiana, Democratic government. They control the legislature. Texas, Arkansas. We can go South Carolina. We can go on and on and on. And so they're controlling the state Supreme Court, legislatures, supermajorities, governor's mansions. And so at the end of the day, what he said, I'm sorry, can't apply because, look, we can't crack through that without the voting rights protection, without getting rid of, rid of political gerrymandering. That's right. But to that point, I am so happy that we do have uh, the Justice Department on our side. We have Kristen Clark, who is the former president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee here, and he's a staunch voting rights advocate. And so I know that we are using every tool in our to ensure the right to vote. And um, I don't want to discourage people from voting. I don't want to send the message that there's no point. There is a point to vote. Um, we do have people on our corner, and I'm still hopeful. 
Well, we have people in their corner. We also have civil rights groups like yours that are actually fighting these battles that people are not seeing. Eonfe, uh, give us a perspective uh, from, uh, in terms of what uh, are you saying to your uh, clinics uh, in these red states? Uh, you know, what is being said right now? Yes. Well, I mean, our health centers in these states are in a really difficult position. You know, they have to d decide like what the risk is like. And there's a risk to their patients, but to their providers who can face criminal pen penalties or jail time for violating these laws and to their staff as well. So these are some really big decisions. And they've been forced into this position because of these anti-abortion lawmakers who are against the values of the majority of people in these states. And so can, it's can I ask you, hold, hold on a second. I want you to clarify something. When you mm -hmm. say they face the risk. So here's the question. If there's a plan, uh, if, if if you have a Planned Parenthood clinic in Arkansas, and the Attorney General has already certified this decision uh, based upon their, their previous laws, uh, are you can Planned Parenthood actually perform abortions? And if they do, are they risking being arrested, or is it outlawed? So again, let's just be for people to be clear in terms of what we're now dealing with. Yes. Yeah, so in a state where the attorney general or the governor has already declared or certified a trigger ban, um, abortion is outlawed. We are not providing abortion. But in a state like Arizona, for example, where there is a pre row ban on the books that could be enforced but has not officially been enforced yet, our clinics there are not providing either, even though they technically could because of the risk assessment. So it really depends on the state um, and the, the, the landscape there. But in states where we have had very definitive um, rulings and certifications from um, state lawmakers, we are not providing. Um, and so, uh, Pilar, I'm looking here at this uh, New York Times story right here, uh, and it says that uh, right now abortion is banned in at least nine states. And it said with trigger bans and several more set to take effect uh, in the coming days. Yes. Um, so these trigger bans have been in place for several months, if not years, in, in some instances. They have been planning for this and they are they were ready for this moment. And, and that's something I would like to emphasize to people. They have been playing the long game. And unfortunately, on, on the side of some of the progressive sides, we didn't take it seriously enough. Um, they have been planning for this moment. They have been preparing for this moment. Something to note, Mississippi, when they initially filed this lawsuit, they did not ask that the court overturn Roe versus Wade. They simply asked that the court enforce their 15 week abortion ban, which would have been devastating, but certainly nowhere near what we're seeing today. Um, and so, so, so really the Supreme Court was waiting for a case. So what you're saying right there is that this Supreme Court went further than this Mississippi law. This court chose to ban, to, to, to get rid of Roe v. Wade. This court chose to ban or to, to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's correct. Um, they were not asked to do so. Um, the, the question presented by Mississippi was whether or not uh, it was lawful to outlaw abortion pre-viability, which was the existing standard. You could get an abortion up until viability, which was about 24 weeks. Um, and then during their briefing, when they saw that the court had kind of turned in their favor, they switched the question into, uh, or they started uh, making much more extreme arguments. The court did not call them out on that, and they just went with it as if it was uh, part of the course. And so this was a very unusual case in the sense that the court went far beyond what was even presented in the initial lawsuit. Uh, I want to bring in Kelly Bethea here because I want to ask her about this along with uh, Melanie Campbell. So, uh, Kelly, uh, and I'm looking at this tweet here from uh, Ron Bra Ronald Brownstein, of course, uh, who is a uh, journalist. Um, uh, with uh, the Atlantic, uh, he actually, uh, he says this here, the growing sense among D activists is that the party's leaders aren't fully facing the challenge. The November centric thinking and business as usual approach of the D parties, septuagenarian and octogenarian leaders who have seemingly little to say about the crisis facing the party. That, that, that really is what we're looking at right here, Kelly, because at the end of the day, um, to respond to this decision, it is going to require a robust response from Democratic leaders. Uh, and yes, you've seen tweets and videos today, but this is one of those moments that they're going to have to figure out how do you marshal the forces? How do you reach those voters? How do you talk to those young voters? How do you rebuild an Obama coalition? Because they are facing uh, a significant uh, red wave in November that can only be stopped if you have maximum turnout. And that's my biggest fear with this, right? Because 
right now what we're seeing is kind of par for the course for the Democratic Party, at least the powers that be in the Democratic Party, when something massive happens. You basically throw a temper tantrum on on the news and in your press releases and any type of exposure that you're going to get. And then when the noise dies down, so does your cause. And we cannot afford to do that right now because the way that I read this case, it goes beyond just the right to abortion. This is about your right to privacy. This is about your right under uh, substantive due process, which is basically the essence of the Constitution, the rights that aren't necessarily stated explicitly in the Constitution, but are still enforced by the Constitution by way of how the Constitution was written by way of between the Bill of Rights and the amendments, right? All of that is under siege right now by way of this opinion. When they did not follow stare decisis, which is basically legalese for I said what I said, that we are going to follow a previous case law to determine what this law is, like a previous panel has said, they didn't even do that here. They skipped over the case at hand in order to just push their agenda. So it's to me, this is more than abortion which is why I'm so angry right now, because when Clarence Thomas talked about the other rights on the table that are um, un that are about to be under attack, he conveniently left out Loving v. Virginia, which is also under substantive due process, which would actually prevent him from being married to his wife anymore. But the hypocrisy of it all and the, the, the asinine behavior of this court to take away rights that aren't necessarily explicitly in the Constitution, but are enforced by the Constitution, the Democrats really need to get on the ball and, and, and sending that message home in that the Constitution is under attack right now, not just because of, of this decision, but of the decisions that are going to happen by way of the way that they decided this case today. Uh, Melanie, uh, that particular point there in terms of, uh, you know, what we are facing, first and foremost, uh, people had an opportunity to brace themselves for this day when that draft uh, by Samuel Alito uh, was leaked uh, several weeks ago. And so, uh, so I saw this uh, comment from Congressman Jim Clyburn, who's called today somewhat anticlimactic, but the reality is uh, it is still uh, shocking and stunning overturning, uh, you know, again, nearly 50 years of Supreme Court precedent. At the end of the day, the only response, and let me be clear, there's only one response, and that is going to be voting. But what has to happen is you've got to have uh, individuals who are messaging properly, who are speaking uh, to the very issues, who are putting the resources on the ground to actually make that happen. And unfortunately, here we are uh, almost at the end of June, uh, going into July, and I'll be honest, uh, Melody, uh, I'm seeing a whole bunch uh, of Democrat organizations, a uh, whole, bunch, whole bunch of Democratic politicians uh, still not doing what's necessary uh, to reach black voters and young voters. And they're sort of playing by that same old playbook. Hey, let's stick around and wait for the second week of October and then we'll engage them. That's going to be a problem come Election Day. Uh, yes, Roland. And it's too quiet. Um, and I think what happened today, hopefully, will wake people up. Um, and the reality is that these folks don't care about the Constitution. They have those who are on the side of this are the same people who support uh, Donald Trump, who are the same people who support uh, uh, voting rights uh, being uh, repressed. Because at the end of the day, they'd rather have a, a authoritarian state. And when you think about uh, if you get out of the beltway and think about what's going on in Florida with DeSantis and some of the laws that he's doing. So there's been a lot of it, Texas, right? So you can see where this is going. And there's a, there, there are folks who believe that they'd rather have minority rule. A few people rule over the majority of us. So yes, there is a new majority in this country by population and by diversity, but there is still those who are have set up a power dynamic that would put all of us in a situation that we would be under almost like an apartheid state. And so that part of it means that if, if, if we don't do all that we can and those 
who say that they understand don't put the resources in yesterday, not tomorrow, yesterday, then the results of the 2022 election are going to be catastrophic beyond anything that we can repair in any period of time in a short, in a short, it will change what this nation really is with all of its flaws. The, the core that was, we were taught was, oh, it's about the constitution, the rule of law and, and, and all of these things until you started seeing the diversity that the census numbers show. And so I, I have a level of cynicism about where uh, our uh, progressive community is really ready to fully fight. I would hope this will wake up people who should have already been woke when voting rights was uh, repealed um, and when we weren't able to get uh, George Floyd. And you had two years ago. We now are facing another summer of organizing and activism. We got to get in the streets. It costs money for that to happen. I've talked to too many organizations that don't have the resources to do what they need right. to do. If you don't have a turnout at the minimum of what happened in 2018, then it's cancel Christmas. That's where we are. And, and young people drove the vote along with, with black women and, and others showed up in 2018. They they know they saw the danger, but they didn't really get the credit, right? But you and then black women voted at 54%, I think it was, and black men close to 50%. We are carrying it. Right. But we put but there were some real there's no resources out there right now. Um, Pilar, uh, just this question for you uh, and, 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 and for people who, who are again, who might think, well, OK, this is just a couple of decisions. This decision uh, wax the Miranda decision, the, um, uh, the, the gun decision. Uh, in September, I'm dropping my book, uh, uh, White Fear, uh, how the brown of America is making white folks lose their minds. Uh, people need to understand what we're what we're facing right now. What we're talking about even goes beyond this case here because conservatives now hold a six to three majority on the Supreme Court. Even if Chief Justice John Roberts chooses to go another way, they can run the table. They can literally. And what we're seeing is not just the Supreme Court. Now we're talking about if Republicans get control of the House and the Senate, what happens there? The only block, if you will, is Biden with veto power. But then we're talking about the state legislatures. Now we're seeing uh, what, what is happening on the county commissioner level, the city council level, the school board level. Uh, and, and I have been saying since 2009 that, look, we, that I said to John Avalon, I said, we're living in the beginning of white minority resistance. And, I, and, 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 and now you're talking about by holding this power, by having these young white conservative Supreme Court justices, their goal is to rule for the next 50 years. And so people need to be understanding they've been playing the long game. I think a lot of Democrats and progressives have not been playing the long game. That's true. I mean, I think we should assume that everything is on the table at this point. Everything. Don't don't assume that um, your your same access to your schools will be the same in the next decade or so. We're already seeing the unraveling at the school level, like you just mentioned. Um, they are very concerned that white students and black students are are waking up to injustices, and they are fighting very hard to ensure uh, that this fifty year plan that they have that there's someone to carry the torch. Um, obviously, it's it's not going to end with the current um, the, the current ruling class. These people are looking to, to, to raise the next generation. And that's how we know that this is the long game. They are playing, they are playing chess. I think the progressives are playing checkers. Um, it's very apparent, even in the messaging, even as far as um, how easily they, they, they grasp um, situations and how they flip the messaging before you even had a chance to read, to read about it. Um, so this is a very serious thing. I assume everything is on the table. Um, they are not playing any games. They are trying to take us backwards, which I think is evident in Justice Alito's opinion, where he heavily relies on the opinions and thoughts of white men in, 17, in the 1700s and the 1800s. I think that gives us a strong clue of what they're trying to do here. Uh, Iante, uh, in terms of, um, look, Planned Parenthood has certainly been one of the groups that have been on the front lines uh, involved in advocacy. Uh, and so what's next for your organization? Yeah, well, we're going to be fighting this fight on several fronts. I mean, we have the healthcare delivery front where we're working to get patients out of state um, when they can't access this care in their own state, you know, working with abortion funds and other independent providers to get people 
the money, the childcare, the transportation, all of those things to get out of state if they can. Um, and then there's the, ele the electoral front, of course, there's a November election coming up. We're working to channel the pain and anger and energy that we're seeing right now into votes in November and keep people motivated on that front. And then we're also, you know, just thinking about litigation. Litigation is a strategy we've used for a long time. And I think you're going to see a lot of filing of litigation very, very quickly. Um, some has already started in many of these states to see if even this trigger ban mechanism is even legal, that you can pass a law that is like a hypo based on a hypothetical that hasn't happened yet. So that's going to be a big part of this as well. And then in states where we do have um, supportive lawmakers, they're going to be showing up access, passing new bills to expand who can provide abortion in those states to expand telehealth services, all those things, because we know that Again, when you ban abortion, people are not going to stop needing to access it. So we're really working on all these fronts to get people the care they need and to hopefully um, build back what we've lost because this, this is the culmination of a 50 year effort from the anti-abortion movement. They have won today, but they're not gonna win in the long game because the majority of Americans do support legal abortion and we are gonna build back what we got step by step, state by state. It will take time, but we're very committed to doing that. Pilar Whitaker, Law Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. I certainly appreciate you uh, joining us on the show. Please keep up uh, the great work that you're doing. Uh, and uh, I always did this with Christian Clark. Uh, I would always remind her when she was uh, on my show or Tom Joyner, uh, always give the website out to donate because uh, y'all need the resources to keep fighting these battles. So where can people support the Lawyers Committee? You can find us at lawyerscommittee.org. Thank you. I really appreciate the support. All right. We appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Yante, thank you so very much as well uh, for joining us as well. Thank you. Kelly, uh, uh, Kelly, uh, you heard Ayanthe talk about what's happening in some of these Democratic states. He's a perfect example of uh, where G uh, Governor Gavin Newsom has already signed uh, this into law. Uh, he just signed a bill that makes uh, California a safe haven for women across the country. Uh, and he says, tweets, we will not cooperate with any states that attempt to prosecute women or doctors for receiving or providing reproductive care. And that's a wonderful sentiment to have, but the fact still remains that while California may still may be a safe haven, we're talking about not just women who have access to get to California, we're really talking about women who don't have access to get to anywhere but their immediate region to get the care that they need. And that is what's frustrating right now. Uh, one of the many things that are frustrating right now, people who are in power, mainly today, SCOTUS, aren't thinking. Like this is beyond just, again, like I said, this is beyond your your right to an abortion. This is your right to care for yourself. This is your right to privacy and your private health. The government shouldn't have anything to do with that. You, you shouldn't have anything to do with my body in this regard. You don't know what it's like. And for the, the, the evangelicals out there that I have seen across my screen and phone today, while I identify as a Christian, even if I didn't, like your God has nothing to do with my body. What, what you believe God has over your temple has nothing to do with my temple and how I deem my temple to be fit for the God that I serve. And not to mention the ch separation of church and state in this regard. I mean, that's just out the window with, with rulings like this. It is absolutely archaic and asinine and absurd to think that other entities have a say in what I do privately. Mind your business and keep it moving. That's really all that I am pro for. Like I am pro mind your business. Leave me and my uterus alone. Frankly, I've had menstrual cycles that have bigger clots than an abortion does. And, and are we going to persecute that? Are we going to chastise and prosecute me for having a menstrual cycle now? Because now that substantive due process is off the table, because that's really what this case is about. That's off the table. What else is going to be off the table? My right to the health care that I want, the way that I want to go to school, the way that I want to raise my children, the way that yes. I want to care for my seniors. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Let's exactly. Be, let's be, exactly. No, no, no. no. Yeah. But again, but again, no, that's what that's what I think people have to understand that this thing goes just sort of goes beyond just uh, this decision here. Melanie Campbell, look at here. Joe Ingalls just tweeted this um, literally um, uh, 20 minutes or so, or 30 minutes ago. 
abortion in Ohio is now banned at the point a fetal heartbeat can be detected. That's about six weeks into a pregnancy before many women know they are pregnant. A federal court just lifted the stay put on the law passed in 219 uh, when Roe was still in effect. And so uh, now, of course, that's one of the places where they have a U.S. Senate race there uh, where uh, Congressman Tim Ryan is facing, uh, of course, a Trump lover, J.D. Vance. That's a state that Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton by 450,000 votes in 2016. He beat Joe Biden there in 2020. Uh, it, it's going it's, it's to be happening. Uh, but again, what people have to understand, Melanie, they have to uh, be prepared. Everything is now on the table. Right. That's that's it was different when you had Justice Anthony Kennedy, who was a conservative, but sometimes he ruled with the liberal justices. And so for that court, he was deemed a moderate. He really wasn't. But for the left foot, but, but, but he, he somewhat was. No, no, no. This case, you've got five hardcore, really six, five hardcore conservatives. And you got a conservative Chief Justice John Roberts uh, who's trying to temper that. But the bottom line is they have control. The That's Supreme right. Court, conservatives, Republicans right now have absolute control of the highest court in the land. And whatever they now decide is law in America, unless... Congress changes the laws, and that's going to require political leaders to get some guts. It's going to require Democrats to, to get rid of the filibuster. Because understand this, Melody, and I got no problem saying it. If Republicans win the White House in 2024 and they control the House and the Senate, you can bet the first bill that they're going to vote on and they will get rid of the filibuster is a national ban on abortion. Oh, yes. Oh, it, this is where we are. It's, it's twenty. It's uh, within two years, and what happens in November of twenty um, twenty twenty two sets sets the table, right? And if you end up with a certain type of Republican controlling all of this, then that's why I say we are looking at an authoritarian state. Because if you have the ability, whether it's Donald Trump or or, or Trump uh, lookalike, that could take over the. The, the, the presidency and you have control of the House and the Senate and the U.S. Supreme Court, all bets are off, right? And history ha can repeat itself, right? Um, and this is where we find ourselves. Um, and so it's going to take, it will take, uh, as, Dr. as, as uh, Bishop uh, Barber, when Barbara explains us in, in what he does with his work, um, and I think it was last week, I couldn't be there, but I know it was last week, uh, with um, the Poor People's Campaign, if we don't find a way to come together in a collective fashion, but Black people can't carry it on our own. We can't carry right. this democracy on our back, right? And that's what that's what it's been. And so we have been there uh, for, when we're fighting for rights, it always helps others, but when, it, when it's time for us, it doesn't. And so here we are, and now, um, and I say, I think young people, this is your, this is your moment, right? And and those of us who are still on the battlefield are gonna keep fighting. But you know, I'm not in. I, I don't. I'm not personally in that category of worrying about my reproductive rights in the same way, right? But but my nieces are, my great nieces are, my and so that's where we are about what kind of future are we are we allowing to unfold for our our this next generation and those who are in position, these young people who are the largest voting block have to use that power. They have to own it because this, if they don't, then what they're setting up for, you said it 50 years in the making uh, will, 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 will happen within a matter of two. When we 50 years, it's going to happen in two years. If they're able to do what, what, where this could go and there is no, there is no pushback. Um, it's not about being alarmed. It's just fact. If people knew this was going to happen. That's why I'm like, okay, okay, what are we going to do? You know, and, the only, and, the, and the only <laughs> way to cut the only way to combat this is what we talk about with Reverend Barber with you all the time. You the only way you have to mobilize and organize. Yep. That's the only way. And we got to use the summer, Roland. We got to huddle. Right? 
Because yeah, we have to have I mean, some yeah, organizing look, and I, activism. I, 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 hey, Melody, I said yesterday. Last month. I said last month. This should be Freedom Summer. This should be Freedom everywhere. Summer 2022. And we gotta knock on. We gotta get on. We gotta do the hard work. Put on our mask. I'm still believing COVID not gone. And do what we need to do because our lives are uh, 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 under attack. Our very ability to be able to live and and, and have some modicum of freedom to live in this country is under attack because you have a group of people who believe who have, who who never sleep. Right. They never slumber. They never a lack of resources. But I still believe that I still believe the half full side. We can push back. But if yep. nothing happens in the next couple of weeks. You cannot show momentary outrage. Uh, Melanie Campbell, uh, Killer Bethea, I want to appreciate both of you for joining us. Uh, look, I, I keep telling people we've been saying this on this show repeatedly. What's going on? What is happening? Folk. Had better pay attention. We appreciate both of you joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Folks, going to a commercial break right now, but we come up, I'm going to play this. The folks at Midas Touch actually uh, put this video out. Again, uh, you know, all, all, you know, when I hear Susan Collins and, and, and Joe Manchin uh, just talk about, oh, you know, uh, you know, oh, you know, we're just so shocked uh, by this and they keep saying, I don't know why you're shocked. Uh, these folks made it clear uh, that they were not telling the truth when they testified uh, before the United States Senate. I believe the Constitution protects the right to privacy, and I have no reason or agenda to prejudge the issue. Roe versus Wade is uh, an important precedent of the Supreme Court. It was decided in 1973. It has been challenged on a number of occasions, and the Supreme Court has reaffirmed the decision. When a decision is challenged and it is reaffirmed, that strengthens its value. Decision. Roe versus Wade, decided in 1973, is a precedent of the United States Supreme Court. It has been reaffirmed, so a good judge will consider it as precedent of the United States Supreme Court, worthy as treatment of precedent, like any other. As a judge, it is an important precedent of the Supreme Court. By it, I mean Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Been reaffirmed many times. Casey is precedent on precedent. I do not believe that Brett Kavanaugh will overturn. Precedents are overturned all the time. They aren't overturned all the time. More he views precedent not just as a legal doctrine, but as rooted in our Constitution. Neil Gorsuch, for whom you voted, don't you think he's probably going to vote to overturn Roe versus Wade if given the chance? I actually don't. Roe is not a super precedent because calls for its overruling have never ceased, but that doesn't mean that Roe should be overruled. Love our new Alexa. It's a Buick. Yeah, Alexa. Buick. Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. Coach, that's a Buick. That's an Alexa. The Buick Enclave with available Alexa built in.